Good morning, Southam. We're so glad you're with us today. Would you stand with us together? All of you online, we're so glad that you're with us today, too. Let's worship the Lord and give Him glory for who He is. Let's praise His name together. We won't fear the battle. We won't fear the night.
Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. Come on, Southland, lift this up. Why did Jesus arise with our freedom? recognize the brokenness that was prior to your death. We praise you for that. Father, we pray that today, um, whatever the enemy is whispering, the lies to us, that we are not worthy, that we should be full of shame, that you don't love us because of something that we have done in our past because we were never good enough. God, those are of the enemy, and we pray right now that the enemy would be crushed underfoot. God, we pray that um, the words that we just sang, that death was truly arrested and our life has begun because of you. We celebrate that and I pray that that would just permeate our minds and our hearts. Help us to have courage to live for you because of that truth. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. of his blood. Is 
know this this weekend I was pulling weeds around our yard and I'm amazed at the ability of weeds to fight against a drought it is impressive and I also thought about how the tree that I planted in the front yard I, I, I've got to water that or it's, it's just going to die it's like it doesn't have a will to live but the weeds do and I thought about in my own life and there are times that I'm craving some of the other stuff that doesn't matter that isn't good for me and sometimes I forget to crave the, the figurative rain from God, His presence in my life, His direction that we so, we so need. That I need that water from heaven. And I thought about the deluge that we got about, I, I watered the tree and then the deluge happened about four hours later and the rain just came down. And how we, we're in this room together and God wants His Spirit to speak to all of us. He craves that presence with us. And how important it is for us to crave that presence for him and to crave what he has for us. So as we sing, open the eyes of my heart. This song is a prayer. That's why we picked it. Let's just ask God to fill our hearts with his presence, to open our eyes, as it says, to see him high today. Praise his name for who he is. And at some point in this song, you want to stand up and worship. You can do that. Be seated for now. Just make this our prayer together.
I was reading some articles and watching some videos uh, last few weeks uh, with the simple question, what's your goal in life or what are your dreams? And it, a lot of them were pretty thought provoking and, and challenging and some people had pretty lofty goals, uh, big dreams. But what guy, and honestly, I'm not sure if he was serious or if it was satire, um, but he said, look, I'm just gonna be honest with you. Here's my biggest dream of my life. He said, first, my dream is to go to work and cuss out my boss and quit. He said, then after that, my second dream is to sleep till noon every day. Then my third dream is to do nothing the rest of the day. My fourth dream is to die happy doing nothing every day. My fifth dream is to come back from the dead and do nothing every day all over again. Those are my dreams click. I thought, that, is that real? I mean, really, is that all there is? Just our dream, our hope is to be able to do something where we could just do nothing. And that's our ambition. I hope you have bigger dreams than that. I hope you have different dreams than that, I should say. And today, we're going to talk about what our goal in life really is, ultimately. This is what Jesus taught us, is that we're designed for a purpose. Now, all through 2024, we're talking about what he said, and we're focusing in on the words of Christ. And in this series, we're talking about what he said about you. And last week, we talked about the fact that you are loved by God. If I had one sermon to preach the rest of my life, that'd be the sermon. You're loved by God. But then we're going to pile on with words that he used about that love of God and, and how that love is the purpose for which we live for. So if you have a Bible or a device with the Bible on it, we're going to be in Mark chapter 12. And Jesus begins to have a conversation with all of these religious lawyers that are trying to trip him up. They were really focused on making people obey their rules. And Jesus was trying to open their eyes to what the scriptures really talk about in relating to God. So after addressing topics that we care about, like paying taxes, or here's one, he talked about who we're going to be married to in the afterlife, in, the, in eternity. He deals with these questions they were asking, and then this lawyer comes to him with this question. Of all the commandments, which one is the most important? And so beginning with verse 29 of chapter 12 of Mark, here's Jesus' reply. The most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater 
than these. In Matthew's account of it, he says all of the laws and the prophets are built upon these two commandments. Now, Jesus' answer, honestly, it didn't surprise anyone. He was actually quoting Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5, which the Hebrew, in the Hebrew is called the Shema, and every uh, Jewish family would quote that Shema every morning when they got up. It was the foundation of their lives. Shema means to hear, and so just like the scripture says, hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. He is only one God, and he's the one you are to love and serve. Now, it was the foundational confession of every follower of Yahweh because there were all these competing gods and competing affections out there that were vying for their heart and their interest. The belief that since since there's only one true God, that that God has created the world and specifically human beings with purpose in mind. His design is that we all have a purpose. We're not just floating around out here in space. This creation matters to him. Now we talked about again last week about how sometimes the most simple statements are the most profound. And here it is. This is what Jesus said. Our design purpose is to love God. Now you might say to yourself, well, well, that's deep. Well, stay with me because we're going to talk about what that means. Now, we talked about the original language last week as well, and we talked about the the actual Greek word that was used here, agape, for the word love. And you may remember agape is unconditional, uh, selfless love that always has the best interest of the one loved first. That's what it means when Jesus or God refers to his love. Now, when Jesus says loving God is our most important command in this moment, That's the word he chooses, not the other words out there for love, agape. Now, it means that we love God with the same unconditional, selfless love that always has his best interest in mind. And what is the best interest of God? As if I can do something for him. Well, here it is, his glory. He gets the glory from my life. That's my expression of love. Now, Jesus said love in God is the most important, therefore, it's our purpose in life, why we live and breathe, to love God with all we are and all we have. Now, how am I designed for that purpose, loving God first above all things? Well, he uses four words to help us with this. He says, with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. And these four words identify the most important parts of your design. When he's talking about your heart, he's talking about your feelings, your emotions, your personal passions in life. When he's talking about your soul, he's talking about your will, your character, how you make choices as to what will be important and what you will do. When he talks about your mind, he talks about how you think and the knowledge you have and discerning truth from falsehood and being able to embrace that truth in your life. And then finally he says, and with all your strength, he's talking about your physical body, a very important part of you. Your energy, your abilities, your creative effort that you put forward. Now, those four things, that's what he says. That's how you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and body, or strength. There you have it. Let's pray the benediction. Let's go home. Well, let's see how those things apply on a daily basis. God gave every aspect of you to you for a purpose, to love him, to be devoted to his will and his glory. I mean, I just pause and say, you know, Phil's talking about pulling the weeds and all the reflection that he has about that. And I think to myself, do I wake up in the morning and think, to my, how am I going to love God today? What is on my to-do list? What is in my tasks that I'm here to perform? What is my work? What is my relationships? What are all of those things? How are those things going to reflect my love of God? And all, meaning every atom of you, is a part of his design to accomplish living love for him. It's a challenge, isn't it? When you think of all of your time, all of your possessions, all of your priorities and abilities fall under the love of God umbrella. 
What am I doing with that stuff? Well, all of those things and attributes operate with your love of God as your primary motivation. And let's be clear, not doing those things in order to earn the love of God or impress God, but rather out of a heart of love, I do these things. And we, when we choose competing affections instead of God, that is what we call, or what he calls, sin. And it's a real competition. I mean, right? You're bombarded every day with all kinds of opportunities that present to you choices that you know do not reflect the design and purpose of God in your life, and yet you find it hard to refuse them. Jesus said loving God with all is the first and most important command. And when we decide to use any of our all for only personal appetites, for only appeasing society and culture or accommodating our insecurities, then we, in essence, miss our foundational purpose. Now, I hope you're getting this because Jesus wanted to make sure you got it, that you wake up every day with a reason to live. And that reason to live is honoring the God who created you. And this is what God wants us to enjoy, using our work, our relationships, our attributes, our wealth to demonstrate the Lord is the ultimate love of your life. And, and, and so I just pause. I mean, get, anytime I ask you a question, I'm asking myself the same question. When I walk through a day and interact with people and intersect with them, what would they say that I love the most? Who would they say that I love the most as they see the things that I prioritize and do? Our activity reflects that love. And it reflects loving something or someone else more than God if it's not part of his design. So Jesus makes sure the lawyer and everyone listening gets it. And this is why I parked there for a minute this morning. Is that you need to know you are designed to love God. I, I think of that and how that lives out in our life. And I think of some friends of Stephanie and mine from way back. Rosemary and Jean Lahoon. And Rosemary, very successful in her career as a nurse. And Jean had his own um, handyman business, and, and he was always busy. Guy could fix anything. And out of the blue, they're praying together, and they decide they believe God has called them to the remote places of New Guinea. Like, just out of nowhere. And, and it was wild, because telling their family telling their friends all of those things that they had to announce and people questioning that decision when they were so successful and so effective in what they were doing, and now they're going to New Guinea. And somebody asked Rosemary, you know, why would you do something like that? And Rosemary said, because I love the Lord, and that's where I can love him best. And think about that. Am I in the place where I'm loving the Lord the best that I possibly can love him. Rosemary refused to use all her all for anything other than the Lord's design for her life. She died serving him there and loved him all the way to heaven. Now, the point is there is only one way to love the Lord and fulfill your purpose. He says, by using all, your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and use it in the way he designed for them to be used. This is what it means to love God, to go wherever he wants you to go and do whatever he wants you to do with all he has designed you to use. Now, that might be a far-off place like New Guinea. That might be the place where you are right now, in the place you work, in the people you know and have the opportunity to influence and serve. Ultimately, it's saying, God, I love you above all things, and wherever you put me, I will live my life for your glory. The bottom line, your purpose is to love God with all. But then Jesus reminds the lawyer of the rest of the Shema. Look at verse 31 again. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. 
You see, again, we're not coming at you with real deep thoughts. We're coming at you with simple thoughts that are complex and difficult to follow because Jesus said our design purpose is to not only love God, but to love like God, to love people like he loves them. Now, remember agape, God's unconditional, sacrificial love devoted to our best interest, devoted to the best interest of the people in your life. Using agape again, Jesus says the same kind of love that God has shown and given to you is the love you are designed to give to your neighbor. And by the way, when questioned as to who is my neighbor, he said basically everyone, including the irritating neighbor, the one who's always yelling at you to get off his lawn. You know, that person that is constantly talking at work and is annoying, or the little brother who uses your stuff without asking, or the lady who cuts you off going 90 mile an hour on the interstate. And yes, I said lady. <laughs> but look at this. You must adequately love yourself before you can adequately love yourself your neighbor. He says, love them as you love yourself. Now, what's that all about? Because it sounds a little narcissistic to me. Well, no, not at all. He explains that God's agape love is now within you when you receive it for yourself. And now you're able to know yourself, accept yourself, and appreciate yourself in the same way the Lord has known, accepted, and appreciated you with his forgiveness and grace. I mean, I say it all the time. God loves you so much, he went to a cross and died for you. I mean, he went to a lot of trouble to communicate to you how much he thinks of you, how valuable you are to him. And now in knowing yourself, you don't have to live in fear or insecurity or low self-esteem or self-loathing because you can now value yourself the same way God values you. And with that kind of appropriate self-love, you're able to live out your designed purpose and give your neighbor a heavy dose of that love that now lives within you. Jesus said your designed purpose is to love God and to love like God everyone in your life. Now keep in mind the contrast with how we sometimes look at people. Not with love, but with judgment. I mean, come on, let's be honest. If I put everybody in this room's video up on the screen from yesterday, just yesterday, how many times would I find you talking about other people in some kind of judgmental way? You know, it, 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 like you know all of their secrets and their motives and everything that drives them. And this is where it can get tricky if we don't understand the love wiring of God. Remember, he said we're designed to agape love in the same way we are agape loved by God. And while we know our own secrets and we know of the times we've not been worthy of God's love, he has still offered us his mercy and his grace. I mean, that's overwhelming to me sometimes. When you think about that you are designed now to reflect that kind of love to others, even the people who don't deserve it. Now, please understand, agape love or the love of God, here it is, does not mean that we affirm or accept everything about our neighbor. In other words, this is the, the modern cultural misunderstanding about the love of God. Some define God's love as affirming every choice or belief our neighbor has embraced. That is not the love of God. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite of the love of God when we refuse to tell people the truth of God's design. I'll give you an example of that. I think Jesus actually provides a great example for us that we can apply to our daily lives with our friendships. In John chapter 8, we see a story about this woman that was drugged into the center square of the town where Jesus was located in his presence. They throw her out there and they're all ready to stone her because apparently she had been caught committing adultery. 
And now before they then started throwing their fastballs, they go to Jesus. And they say, Jesus, what do you think we should do with this woman? And essentially he says to them, all right, all of you who are without sin, you throw the first stone. And looking at him and looking at themselves and knowing the reality of who they really were, each one of them began to drop their stones on the ground and walk away till they were all gone. And it was just Jesus and this woman left standing there. And Jesus looks at her and says, where are all your accusers? And she has no idea. And he says to her, listen, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, it's important for us to understand the magnitude of what he just said there. He didn't pat her on the back and say, it's all right, honey, you just be you. And you go make your own choices, and that's fine. Don't worry about this. You know, everybody messes up. And, and by, besides, you know, maybe you really love the guy. or maybe you know, it's, He didn't say anything like that. He called it, what did he call it? A sin. He said, look, this is not the way God designed your life. So I'm not going to condemn you. Here's mercy and grace that I'm handing you. But go and don't continue in that way of living, but rather seek God and his design for your life. He did not affirm her lifestyle choice. He told her the truth about it, and then he offered mercy and grace in a merciful and gracious way. This is how he calls us to love others. We're designed for this purpose, to reflect the mercy and grace that God demonstrated when Jesus interacted with that woman caught in adultery. Not to affirm sin, but communicate God's forgiveness and love in the midst of sin. It's never loving to ignore, affirm, or elevate as a new cultural ethic that which God has called sinful. Now look, I get it. Sometimes this is hard for people to hear, especially if you're like new to us or you just came into this room today, you were invited by somebody. And we just understand this. We believe that the Bible is God's word for the the human race and tells us his story so that we can relate to him. And so because he said this, this isn't me saying it, because he said this, we believe it's in the best interest of our life. Why? Because he loves us. And that's why he's given us this word. And it might seem so different than what is taught to you by culture or media or education or friendships. But in the end, he's saying, because I love you so much, you can trust me with right and wrong, good and bad, true and fake. But we can communicate those designs of God for him with a loving and gracious spirit because he gives us his Holy Spirit. He fills our hearts and lives when we put our faith in him so that we can tell his story and share his design in a way that's loving and kind. But what happens next points us to how all of this fully lives out in our life. Let's keep reading now in Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse 32. The teacher of the religious law replied, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth by saying there is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and with all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. Now, realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. I love that part. See, this exchange helps us understand that sometimes we get it wrong, but he shows us the way to get it right. Jesus said our designed purpose is to live in the kingdom of God. Now, I honestly think that to myself when I wake up in the morning. I can live in this earth, and I could live in this nation. I could choose my kingdoms to be that small, or I can recognize that all of this planet is just a BB in the imagination of God and all he has created. 
why wouldn't I want to live in his kingdom instead of the kingdoms of this earth? Now, whenever I read this story, I'll be honest with you, I find myself laughing because this guy has no idea that he's talking to God in the flesh. And I love it when Jesus responds with the Shema, this guy affirms his answer. Like, good job, Jesus. You know, I think of myself as talking to maybe some amazing scholar or author who has brilliant ideas, and he shares a brilliant idea with me, and I look at him and I say, that's amazing, Dr. Brilliant. Good job. Pat on the back. I mean, here's the God of the universe quoting the scriptures to this guy and the irony of him complimenting Jesus. But Jesus doesn't dial in on the irony of that. He actually affirms the man's reply when he says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, what was the man's reply that led to Jesus' affirmation? The Shema. The foundational truth that every person was quoting that we should love God with all our heart and our neighbor as ourself. Because he understood it to be the greatest of all commands as well, Jesus let him know he was on his way to understanding his purpose and why he was designed the way he was. And that's just it. I ask myself the question now. Well, okay. I don't want to be a citizen of the BB of God's imagination. I want to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. How do I do that? Well, what should I look at if I want to live in his kingdom? Now, don't forget what else the men said. It's much more than burnt offerings and sacrifices. I mean, I want you to get this part today. In other words, to live out our purpose in loving God and loving like God, we focus more on our heart and attitudes and behaviors. Jesus said to love God and love like God is what makes you a citizen of God's kingdom. Now, this is so much bigger and important than all of the things our culture and world want to press upon us. Now, if we want our careers to be our ultimate goal, or our financial success our ultimate goal, or our relationship success or status success to be our ultimate goal, we'll realize that those are all fine, but they leave us wanting more, so much more. They're all wonderful when you see them as a tool to love God and love others more than an end in and of themselves. But that's what we do. We, we let the world tell us what should be important. And then we chase hard after those things, wanting so much for those things to replace the love of God that we should be receiving and living in. And let me, let me tell you a quick story of how this works in a person's life. Um, this past April, 2023, a guy named Stanley Tam passed away. Stanley was 107 years old when he passed away last April. Now, the interesting thing about him is when he was young and first went into business, he went broke. He only had $17 to his name, so his dad gave him a little bit more money, and with $35 in 1955, he started a company called U.S. Plastics. Now, he said, though, in his praying about that, that, you know, Lord, I, I want to make this company work, and how can I make this company work when the last adventure that I tried didn't work? And he sensed God saying to him, will you trust me with your business? And so Stanley said, so I decided right then God was going to be the principal owner of this business, and I gave him 51% ownership of the company. And he said, at that point, then, the more I saw God blessing us, and we were we were sending 51% of our profits to ministries and global mission organizations all over the world. He said, I realized God didn't want 51%. God wanted 100% of it. So Stanley decided he would pay himself a modest salary commensurate with the other executives in his company. And then beyond that, all of the pro profits of U.S. plastics would go to support global mission work around the world. And now they're contributing $150 million to global missions and 260,000 people a year 
receive Jesus who, who are under the, the, the ministry of those organizations because Stanley said, I'm going to support them. Uh, Warren Hard Hardig told me at, in between services today, he said, Stanley Tam himself, he recorded all of it throughout his lifetime, led over 400,000 people to the Lord. All because he said, I love God and I'm a part of his kingdom. I'm going to live my life in the eternal, in the big picture, and everything I have. I mean, Stanley was intelligent, and he was gifted, and he was magnetic, and he was full of energy, and he could have been a very wealthy man. But instead, he said, all of it, all of it is going for the glory of God, because I live in his kingdom. And living in his kingdom is where you discover your purpose is so much more than a bigger house or a cooler car or the fullest closet you can pull from every day. Living in his kingdom means your deepest desire is to give the Lord Jesus the attention he deserves so others can discover the love and mercy and grace you've experienced. Look, I tell you about Jean and Rosemary, and I tell you about Stanley, because I'm showing you that you can love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You can love your neighbor as yourself, and you can be a citizen of the kingdom of God. That's your purpose. And men and women, not because I said it, but because he said it. And it's a big thing that he wants you to know. Now look, we're going to pray together, and I don't normally do this, but today I'm going to offer an opportunity for you to repeat a prayer. Don't pray it if you don't mean it. I mean, I really want you to mean it. But I thought all together we could pray today and ask the Lord to help us love him with all our heart and to love like he loved and to make us citizens of his kingdom. And I'm encouraging you to pray this prayer with me. Let's bow our heads. Just pray it out loud. Lord Jesus, I want to love you with all I am. I want to love people like you love people. And I want to live in your kingdom. Right now, I'm giving all to you. Wherever you want me to go, whomever you want me to love, whatever you want me to give, right now, I'm saying to you, it's all yours. My heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength. Help me continue giving all to you. Well, Lord Jesus, you hear our prayers, and now we pray you'll seal them to our hearts. That when we are going from this place, we'll remember what we've prayed to you today. And that you will put it on our heart to make you first, and we will discover it's the most rewarding, most wonderful place to be. But Lord, in praying these things, we need you to show us what needs to go in our life, what affections compete against our love for you, and Lord, help us to put those to death and fill us with your Holy Spirit so we can live our lives loving you, loving like you love, and as citizens of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, let's stand and let's seal that with a declaration as we sing this song together. Make this song a statement that you believe he deserves all.
that word high means he is the highest in our mind and our heart. He deserves our greatest affection and attention. And I'm praying that that's the commitment that you made today when you prayed that prayer, that you'll go from here firmly committed to loving God, loving like God loves, and living in his kingdom. And all of you with us online, thanks a lot for being part of this service. I hope that you'll get back here soon and in person, but we know a lot of you are on vacation. 
Glad that you connect this way. Stick around for just a minute, and Gretchen's going to talk a little bit more about how you can respond to what you experienced in worship today here at Southland. God bless you. Have a great week.